four or five guys that are coming up the ridge. It's kind of whack-a-mole. Brady and I ended up shooting rounds between a bunch of rocks and just ricocheting a bunch of rounds into the dudes. About some naval gunfire. <laughs> the three of you just decided you were gonna go do this. And we're like, yep. And he's like, man, you guys have some huge balls. <laughs> you went to Africa. Yeah. Towards yeah. the end of your towards the end of your time. Yeah, so the end of the 06 rotation, um, I came back. Uh, a guy that I had worked with that had been my team leader for a brief stint had moved to a different place in the building um, doing more clandestine work um, or, or advanced forces AFO stuff. Um, so in the years leading up to 2007, um, General McChrystal, who was a JSOC commander, had been slowly but surely spreading out intelligence collection kind of around the globe. Uh, and I think, you know, the phrase was you need a network to fight a network. Um, and he was smart enough to identify that Al-Qaeda has got cells all over the world. There's a, a network of folks that are communicating. Uh, the long and short of it is there's a lot of people out there that want to kill Americans and that have been a part of that. Um, and we need to be forward and collect intelligence in other countries besides Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so in, in uh, late 06, um, I got asked to, to try out, to come up and try out for this other part of our organization um, that was really focused on stuff outside of, of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and at the same time that I had gone through that and done that and, and joined that part of the building, um, they stood up a new task force in D.C. And the task force was designed with combating AQ threats, um, greater GWAT stuff outside of the Middle East. Uh, the Horn of Africa was a particularly big hotbed. Um, what they had figured out was that Somalia being the lawless land that it is, um, was the perfect place to not only recruit from, but to ship foreign fighters from various countries around Africa and the Middle East down to, to train them, prepare them, give them skills like IED building and marksmanship and whatever. Um, and then put them on boats, ship them up to Yemen, and then via Yemen back into the Middle East to, to go kill Americans, wherever that may be. So it was an integral part of the Farm Fighter Network, um, and we wanted to do something about it. Um, so in early 07, or I guess early spring of 07, um, I got to deploy to the Horn of Africa, um, working out of the embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we had you know, intelligence collection in various countries throughout the Horn. Um, but I was one of two guys from my organization. Uh, we had two guys from, from Dev Group, um, two guys from, from the Air Force equivalent of those two organizations, so a combat controller and a pararescue guy, two guys from another Army organization um, based out of Virginia, uh, and then a couple of uh, Ranger rec rec Recon Detachment um, operators. So we called it the Rainbow Coalition because it was two guys from each color of the rainbow. <laughs> Two guys from green, two guys from blue, two guys from red, two guys from white. That was our little joke. Along with a bunch of other assets that were involved with uh, really intelligence processing and understanding. Um, yeah, Africa was different in that it was new. I wasn't surrounded by my squadron mates. Um, I was lucky in that the SEALs that I ended up with were guys that were a part of the exchange back early on in the war. Okay. Um, that McChrystal had directed and we were all kind of at the same points in our career. Um, so while they were moving into the, you know, the clandestine element of their organization, I was doing the same. So when we met in Africa, it wasn't the first time we'd ever seen each other. Um, so it made for a very easy, comfortable environment where we could do some high level stuff together without a whole bunch of time to train together, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, limited assets. We didn't have much. Um, we had no like ISR. We had no predators. We had no close air support. We had no AC-130. Uh, Nothing. Our, our intelligence collection was human, was meeting with people on the ground um, and gathering information. We had a signal intelligence platform. So we had one airframe that flew overhead that listened to real time voice calls um, via their iPhones and other handheld satellites that the terrorists were using. Um, and we had a couple of indigenous speakers that we would put on the plane and would listen to those real-time phone calls and had been doing it for the last five years and could recognize key players' voices. Uh, and Damn. so that was literally how we were targeting. Um, to fast forward, uh, in, I guess, the tail end of May, early June, 
Um, we started getting some traffic in Mombasa, Kenya. So we had some human intelligence that directed us to there. Uh, and then we put some asset, that one asset that we had overhead. Um, and lo and behold, they got a hit on on the two, probably two of the most wanted guys in the world, which were a guy named Haroon Fazul and a guy named Saleh Nabhan, which were responsible for the U.S. Embassy bombings in um, Nairobi, Kenya and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania in 1993. Uh, and so long time targets been on the list for a long time. This is 2007. So a long time later, but what they were involved in was basically that foreign fighter trafficking into and out of Southern Somalia, um, and the training of those guys and then subsequently moving them back into the middle East. So we knew we needed to do something. We just didn't have the assets to like go interdict anywhere. And we certainly couldn't do a hit in downtown Mombasa, Kenya. Um, so we got lucky. Um, the last communication we had from them was that they were boarding a boat and it was 18 to 20 terrorists or so, and that they were headed North. Um, they were stopping in Southern Somalia and then continuing on to Sanaa, Yemen, uh, where they were going to dump their guys off or movement into the Middle East. So on the onset, we had what we thought were the number two and three most wanted dudes on the planet. Osama bin Laden being number one, this was two and three and outside of the Middle East, we had them on a boat. We had them moving north along the coast of Somalia, uh, but we had no way to interdict them at sea. Uh, so we came up with a hasty plan. Uh, we had been working um, the the CIA over the years leading up to that had developed uh, a relationship with some folks in Somalia, um, and one of them was the well, the Puntland Defense Force, so northern Somalia in the town of Basaso. Um, these were basically. Somalis that were recruited uh, via various means, but mostly money, um, to help us achieve things in that country. Um, so they were the best friends money could buy at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, we ended up flying from Nairobi, Kenya up to Djibouti, where there was a U.S. naval base. Um, we dumped half of our guys there. Uh, and then three of us flew from Djibouti. When I say half, it's like, so six guys. Yeah. We left three in Djibouti, um, to coordinate some assets or what we had, you know, like an aircraft, if we needed it for Kazavak, start talking to our higher headquarters about what's going on and what we're trying to do. Um, and then we flew and forward staged in, in Basaso, Somalia and linked up with the, the PDF as we called them. Uh, the PDF there was led by a guy that was basically a former Somali warlord, um, but again, he was uh, sympathetic to our cause and was not a fan of foreigners and foreign fighters coming into Somalia to train. Like that just wasn't, he wasn't good with that either. Um, so his name was Bashir. Um, and so we linked up with Bashir, a handful of his guys, uh, and we basically tried to figure out what we were going to do about this boat moving north. And we were kind of hoping and praying that we would pick him up again and get a good fix on their location or that they would stop and they would give us some course of action. Well, about the time that all this is going on, we're flying a plane up the coast of Somalia, you know, trying to gather some whatever we can, uh, and they catch them on the phone. And they had, so high sea state off the Horn, which is a notoriously bad, like, shipping lane in terms of sea conditions, they had, rough seas had forced them aground uh, on the coast and actually damaged their ship. It was in the town of Bargal. And they got in a shootout with locals in the town. They stole a bunch of supplies like water and food from the townspeople. And then they moved up into the hills just outside of town. So they couldn't get back on their boat because their boat was damaged. All we got, so now we're getting real-time human intelligence, all we got out of the townspeople was that, hey, these guys are all foreigners. Like, they're all from other places. And they, they're heavily armed. They have a bunch of guns. There's a bunch of them. Um, and we don't understand why they're here. Like, this is the conversation that's going on. So, you know, the three of us that were in Basaso, it was me, um, a, a guy from Dev, and a CCT guy. Uh, we're like, well, we got to do something. Like, we have an opportunity to get, you know, number two and number three most wanted dudes on the planet. Like, we, we got to do something. So we came up with a plan with, with, uh, with Bashir and the, and the PDF guys that we were gonna fly um, and get as close to Bargal as we could, stop about two hours west of the town, and then he was gonna coordinate for some folks in the area to come pick us up, and then you know we were gonna drive into Bargal and figure out you know what we were gonna do with this. So 
that all went down um, when we were on the way out of town. Uh, Brady and I, the CCT guy and I were in one vehicle, and, and, and Phil, the, the Navy guy, was in the other vehicle, and we're with Somalis. And we're driving down the road, and this vehicle comes screaming down the road behind us, like high rate of speed, like dirt spilling out everywhere. And we're freaking out. Like none of the guys in the car speak English. The only person that does is Bashir. He doesn't know what's going on, and this car is chasing us down. So they're honking their horn, they're honking their horn, and our guys pull over. And we're like, what are you doing? So we're ready to go, thinking this is somebody that spotted us coming out of town. And they pull up, (coughs) stop, get out. It's guys that they know. What it was was they had forgot their big bags of cot, and they didn't want to leave without them. They forgot their drugs. Yeah. So, And that was typical working with Somalis. You know, about midday, they would start chewing cot. Mid-afternoon, they were useless. So if you didn't get it done in the morning, it wasn't happening. But uh, yeah, so that was a little high stress moment leading up to that. But we ended up getting on a plane, flying out. Um, his guys showed up, so it was the three of us, uh, Bashir, and a handful of his of his loyalists, uh, and we drove into Bargal. Um, on the way into Bargal, we were kind of working on a hasty plan, and we had nothing, you know. So we just kind of worked with what we knew to be true, what we had hard facts on, and we kind of backwards planned from there. So, you know, Brady, the CCT guy was like, look, man, we need a way to get out of here. Like, what are our options? Like, we've got a fixed wing plane in Djibouti that could come get us. we got our guys that are coordinating there, and we've got some PJs that were stationed there. So we've got some options, but it's like five hours away. And he's like, well, there's a Russian airfield that's south of the city that I saw on the map, old dirt strip. He's like, why don't we stop on the way into town and survey that airfield and make sure we can land that bird there just in case. Perfect. Great idea. So we stopped, surveyed the airfield. It was probably the quickest airfield survey a CCT guy has ever done, but he felt good enough that we could land a plane on this dirt strip. So we picked up, we left from there. Phil, the Navy guy's like, hey man, there's a Navy destroyer off the coast. Can't see him, but he's out there somewhere doing anti-piracy operations. So this is before Captain Phillips, a year before that all went down. But so they're out there just burning holes in the ocean, trying to deter Somali pirates from doing what ended up happening a year later. And so he's like, why don't we call that destroyer? It was the USS Chaffee. And Brady's like, cool. He's like, I can do that. Like, we'll call him in the blind and be like, hey, you got U.S. forces on the ground. He's like, I can pre-plan some targets. You know, they got deck guns. Like, if we get in trouble, we've got some naval gunfire. Awesome. Great. And they're like, well, how are we going to do this? And I'm like, well, I think we just basically need to get there with our dudes. We need to set up a patrol base between the town and wherever we think they are because we don't have an exact on their location. I said, it's 110 degrees outside. Let's bring the aircraft down so they can hear it. Let's bring the boat in over the horizon line so they can see a U.S. naval warship off the coast and set up a patrol base out of small arms range but where they can see us. Let's just wait them out. I'm like, there's nowhere to go. They're thousands of miles in any direction from the next town through the desert. It's 110 degrees outside. Their boat's damaged. I go, they're going to start being heat casualties soon. Like, they weren't prepared to be here. We are. We have the ability to access the town, whatever, and we've got some friendlies, Somali friendlies with us. We'll just wait it out. So we pull in. Everybody's good with it. The three of us feel good about it. You know, it's basically the three of us and and eight or ten Somalis. So to our knowledge, there's 18 to 20-some of them, and they got bell feds and a bunch of other stuff. We didn't have shit. We had rifles and pistols. Uh, and a handful of Somalis with AKs. We, we did have two machine guns, um, but not a ton of ammunition for either one of those that the Somalis brought with them. And so we set up our little hasty patrol base, and we're waiting. And in the early day, early part of the day, it's hot, and we're dying, and Bashir's like, we need to go get these guys. And we're like, nah, man, we can't do it. And again, he's the only one that speaks English. He's like, no, we need to go do it. And he keeps pressing. And like, we can't figure out why. And he keeps pressing, keeps pressing. Still can't. Like, Bashir, just calm down, man. And what it was is he didn't understand. He's like, he can see the boat, too. We didn't say anything about it. He can hear the plane. And he's like, at one point, he's like, why don't you just drop a bomb on him? And we're like, one, we don't know exactly where they are. We have no way of geolocating them. Two, the battery died on their phone. They're not talking anymore. So we don't know if they moved. We don't know what's going on. We just know they're in those hills somewhere. We're like, three, like, we haven't worked a whole lot together. So, like... This is a dangerous thing. Like, we just need to wait these guys out. Well, he loses patience. So it's probably 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he comes over to the three of us. So the Somalis are kind of spread around, just doing their thing, chewing cot. And the three of us are, like, 
just trying to figure out like what's next because we can't just shoot naval gunfire. Like we basically have to get in an engagement to do anything, and we're in a country we're not supposed to be in. We got no air assets, no cast, no nothing. So Bashir walks over and he goes, "I'm taking my guys and I'm going over the hill to kill them." And I go, "What?" And he goes, "You can come with me if you want, unless you're scared." He punked us, literally punked Holy us. Holy shit! And so. I, I'm like, all right, Bashir, you know, straight face. I'm like, I, I, I get it. I get it. Like, we, we need to do something. I understand. I go, can you give us a minute? Let us talk and come up with a little hasty plan here. And, I, and I'll be right back with you. He says, fine. So he walks off to his guys. And I turn around where he can't see me. And I start laughing. And Phil and Brady are like, what are you laughing at? And I go, you guys aren't going to believe this. I was like, but when you go through Robin Sage in the Q course, you have a G chief, a guerrilla warlord guy that's pretending that's his thing. And he has his little G's. <laughs> and I go, and they act like complete assholes and they do things like this. And when you're in the Q course, you're like, no way this ever happens. And here we are in Somalia. <laughs> and this former warlord is going, are you too scared to come with me? And so... You know, we had a quick conversation, and I'm like, look, we're going to lose the faith of these guys. These are our only security. We're a five-hour flight, a really long swim to a boat. We got no assets, no nothing. Like, we can't lose this. Like, we need to keep these guys on our side. We didn't trust them to begin with. You know, we hadn't worked with them a whole bunch, and it wasn't a very comfortable feeling. It wasn't like we had been training these guys and working with them for months on end. Yeah. Um, supposedly, the CIA had trained them for the last few years, but... I can tell you what we saw was not a highly trained force. <laughs> so anyway, so we, we end up pulling Bashir in and we explain to him that basically we're going to do a movement to contact, you know, bounding overwatch. Um, and we ended up putting the gun teams on either side, not so much because of the tactics, but because we were afraid about having them too close to us yeah. and what would happen. So we had a gun team to, the, to our right flank, a gun team to our left flank. The three of us were staying together no matter what. And then we had a couple other Somalis and Bashir with us and so we start this bounding overwatch we'd move a gun team up move another gun team up and so on and so on and so we crest over the first hill about the time we get over the first hill headed up to the larger ridge we hear a belt fed open up and it's to the north of us and they're shooting at our the guys on our right flank can't tell exactly where it's coming from but we can tell that that's the only ones that they can see so we continue to move up to gain the high ground on this ridge line to try to get a better fix on their position. About the time we get up there, we realize where they are, not too far from our position. We engage those guys, but then all hell breaks loose. So in the draw behind the ridge that we're on, we're taking heavy fire. Ineffective, we're behind like this ridge of rocks. So we've got some cover. It's good cover, but man, they are just um, So we got a couple of dudes that have been dealt with on the north side, but they have shot and wounded both of the guys in our gun team to our right flank about the time that we're trying to figure out exactly where they are below us now we got no grenades we've got nothing like i said Shit. small arms about that time bullets come i'm here phil and bashir over there the two somalis are a little bit further to his left and then the gun team is beyond them and then brady's on my right and then the wounded gun team on his right and so Rounds come cracking right across the front of me, the cover I'm standing at, like skip off the rock right in front of me. And Brady and I both look left at the same time, and dudes are maneuvering up the ridge line. There's four or five guys that are coming up the ridge. And so all this in a split second, that first like barrage of fire, Bashir is like just standing out in the open, gets shot three times. So Phil grabs him, pulls him down behind cover, and is like packing like Curlex and gauze in his holes. Brady and I both turn, and I move to a piece of cover between me and the guys on the left flank. Yell to Brady, hey, move to me, move to me, move to me. Suppress the fire, Brady moves to me. Now it's the two of us. The two Somalis that are up here with us are now cowering down behind the rocks and terrified, like not returning fire, not anything. And I think, well, at least they're not going to shoot us, right? They're yeah. there. The gun team between us and them <clears throat> are now in a shootout with the guys. So half the guys that are coming up the ridge are shooting at the two Somalis on our left flank. The other half of the guys are shooting at Brady and I. It's kind of whack-a-mole. Um, Brady and I ended up shooting rounds between a bunch of rocks and just ricocheting a bunch of rounds into the dudes, and they would peel out to one side or the other, and you know we kind of dealt with it. But Anyway, in the midst of that portion, um, we ended, ended up dealing with all those guys, but they had wounded not just Bashir, but the other two guys. So now I've got five wounded Somalis, including the only one that speaks English. 
Shit. and the three of us. So everybody on the ridge is down. I'm not worried about. It doesn't seem to be. We have good visibility that we've got any more threat coming up the ridge line above or below. But we're still getting hammered from down below. And I'm like, I don't like I don't know what our move is from here. Like the three of us were like, we don't have a lot of options here. And Brady goes, How about some naval gunfire. <laughs> And so, you know, we kind of, the three of us kind of looked at each other and we're like, all right, yeah, we can do this. Like, let's just have, they're all in one spot. Let's hammer this draw. We had already talked to them, pre-planned targets. Um, so the boat was ready and aware and they were jacked up. Like, they didn't even know we were there. I so thought they were fucking we, pumped. We called them in the blind. It was a really funny, like, 20-minute conversation before we had gotten into that position. And, and you could hear them in the background, like, yeah! Like, they knew they were getting ready to get some. And so Brady is... On the horn with the boat. I have a handheld satellite radio because I'm like, we can't do this unless I call troops in contact over the SATCOM. Like, they got to know we've been engaged, that yeah. we didn't just shoot naval gunfire into a country we're not supposed to be into. And so, yeah, so Brady's talking to the boat, calling a naval gunfire. I'm calling in troops in contact over SATCOM. I said that we had wounded, but I didn't say who um, because I was worried that if it was just Somalis, we weren't going to get the same reaction. Uh, which I don't know if that was the right call or the wrong call, but it was the call that I made at the time. Um, and so we ended up grabbing up as many of the Somalis as we could, and we started pulling back off the ridge. Right about that time, rounds come overhead. I, I think Brady shot, had him shoot like 24 rounds or something off the deck guns into the valley and walked him up and down as we pulled back off the ridge. So we get back down to our patrol base. There's no more fire coming from the hills other than you know the smoke and everything that's left, dust from the naval barrage. We get in the patrol base. Um, Phil basically, like almost on his own, I think I helped him with like the first two guys treating casualties, but Phil basically patched up all them dudes by himself. Um, I was talking to Basasso. Basasso was talking to Djibouti. Djibouti was talking to Nairobi. Nairobi was talking to JSOC at Bragg. JSOC at Bragg was talking to SecDef in DC. <laughs> So this was like, damn, like it was wild. Yeah. Um, and again, they asked me twice about casualties. And I said, you know, we're currently, we have a casualty collection point. We're treating our wounded. Um, we're unsure of their status at this moment, but that we were working on it and we were all right. But we needed Kazvac and we needed it now because they were a five hour flight away. So we patch up the Somalis. It's getting dark now. There's no sounds there's no fire there's no nothing coming out of the hills and basically we don't have an, a, the ability to like go over there at night we've got no workforce anymore we had three somalis i think down in the village that had weapons but they weren't really a part of what we were doing so we had those three stay in the patrol base and we commandeered a couple of vehicles from town we loaded up the wounded and we drove the you know 10 minutes down the road to get to the dirt airfield uh However many hours later, they landed a casa on the dirt airfield, and our guys from Djibouti got out, um, along with a bunch of PJs that they brought from Djibouti to secure the wounded and treat those guys. Uh, they got off with us, so ammo resupply, brought some other stuff with them. Um, the bird left with the wounded to fly back to Djibouti, uh, and then the five of us went back to the patrol base and basically just camped out for the night until the sun came up. Um, we didn't tell anybody that there weren't any Americans on the plane, the wounded. So when it showed up in Djibouti, it was PJs with a bunch of wounded Somalis and no one in Djibouti was even aware of the operation. <laughs> so they ended up, they ended up in the hospital there on the naval base in Djibouti. Uh, and all those guys ended up living, which is cool. But, um, but yeah, we kind of surprised them with that one. So the sun comes up the next morning. Uh, we ended up going over the hill as a as a more capable force because um, now there were six of us. Uh, and we had one local that we had recruited out of town that spoke enough English that we could at least communicate with the Somalis that were with us. Um, they weren't really willing to go over the hill again because they had witnessed what happened the day before. Um, but they eventually and reluctantly came with us and we thought, at least they could help us with recovery of some of the bodies if it was two and three or whatever. Yeah, no, they're Arabs and they weren't touching a body after that much time later. 
So we ended up moving through the area. Um, a couple of guys dying. Most of them were already dead. Um, we had a guy that we thought for sure was uh, Harun Fazul. Uh, looked just like him. I mean, same skin tone and uh, had a pair of glasses. Like, it was a lot of similarities that it, we thought it was him. Nobody that looked like Nabhan. Um, and the rest of the guys were like a who's who of bad guys from around the globe. Like, two guys with British passports. Uh, like, legit British passports. Oh, no shit. A Yemeni, a Syrian. Like, it was this random collection of... It was exactly what we thought it was. Um, and so, we're on the radio. We've got a possible for, for you know, Harun Fazul, whatever his call sign was at the time. And they're like, all right, well, uh, we're going to fly in an SSE team to do DNA testing and confirm. We need you to take them up to the site. And we're like, we're not doing that. And they're like, why, why wouldn't you do that? And I'm like, I'm not taking an FBI team that's never been to combat, never been trained into the hills of northern Somalia where I don't know how many guys are still running around out here. Like, I had no way to confirm or deny if we'd gotten them all. I knew we had a bunch of bodies, but I had no way of knowing if we had gotten everybody. And so there's some back and forth on the radio. What we ended up agreeing on was we bagged up the guy that we thought was Harun Fazul, and we carried him off the mountain, threw him in the back of a truck, and then drove him down to the airfield. So when they landed, all they had to do was get off the plane and deal with the possible. Um, and then we could give them all the other intel we collected, so passports and money and computer. They had laptops and all kinds of stuff. Smorgasbord of intel it was a decent decent hit in that respect. But, but yeah, so the, the FBI guys get off the plane. <clears throat> I unzip the body bag for them. You know, they peel it back. It took him two seconds. They grabbed him. They rolled him up on his side. They pulled his shirt up, and he had no scar. And they said, it's not him. And I, we were like, what? And they're like, it's not him. I'm like, how do you know that fast that it's not him? You didn't do anything. And they go, yeah, Harun Fazul had appendicitis. He had his appendix taken out in whatever year. He's got no scar where his appendix was removed. And we're like, damn, that quick. They just shut. Like, <laughs> all that for nothing, you know. We're all proud of ourselves. Um, so we're bummed out. We're like, all right, well, let's wrap it up. Like the rest of those bodies, we got plenty of intel. Like it is what it is. Like the Somalis are all still alive. They're back in Djibouti. Let's get out of here. So we loaded up and flew back to Djibouti. You know, there's a little bit of a reception there from the handful of people that did know where we were. Um, we get to the hangar and, you know, all three of us are just covered in blood, you know, not our own, but I've got cuts all up and down my arms from the sharp corally rocks that we've been moving around on the ridge line. And then, you know, the Somali, the wounded Somalis and all that stuff. <coughs> so we looked quite a sight to people that saw us coming into the hangar that we were in. And about five minutes after we're there, a little Navy dude comes knocking on the door, opens the door, comes in. He says, Hey, uh, the Admiral that is in charge of the base, needs whoever was just involved in whatever went down to come brief him. And we're like, uh, okay, um, can you give us a few minutes like to clean up, like whatever? And he's like, well, I, and he just said as soon as possible. And we're like, okay, whatever. So we'll tell, let's tell him we're coming. So the kid leaves. We like run through the shower, put on a fresh set of DCUs or whatever we were wearing, pants and shirts and so we leave, we walk onto the main compound there off the airfield. <clears throat> we finally find where his little headquarters is. We walk in and his one of his staff O's or secretary or somebody's like, you know, the admiral's back here, blah, blah, blah. So they take us in this little conference room. And he's sitting at the head of the table. He's standing up and a couple of his staff officers, you know, junior guys are, are in the room with him. And he's like, gentlemen, how you doing? Come on in and have a seat. And so we go in and we sit down. And he's like, and it, mind you, the whole way over there, we're like, we're screwed. Like, this dude is going to flip a gasket. Like, who are you? How was I not aware of this? How did you involve my warship that I'm responsible for? Who cleared this? We're assuming no conversation has been had, and it hasn't. So he's like, look, he's like, you guys have had a pretty wild, uh, rough uh, 24 hours, huh? And we were like, yes, sir. Like, just waiting. And he's like, so, so tell me the story. Like, how did you get there? And we're like, well, and we kind of gave him the brief. Like, we've been doing some targeting. We've been working on this. We've been in and out of Somalia a number of times. We had an opportunity um, at some really important folks and, and to disrupt the network in a substantial way. And we just felt like it was an opportunity that we needed to take. Um, and he's like, well, you know, had you been planning this? And we were like, nope. It was pretty much a hasty decision that was supported by 
three letter agencies and, and DC in the moment because of the significance of the targets. And, and yeah, they asked us if we were okay doing it. And that's what we did. And again, I'm waiting for the reaction. And he goes, that's the coolest shit I've ever heard. <laughs> that's and, awesome. And, and Fe 